see the sidewalk is, is clean and clear. There you go, Charles. Hey. The sidewalk is clean and clear because I didn't realize it's heated. And I look out and there's no cars in the parking lot. There's these full track vehicles. I don't mean half tracks. I mean full track vehicles. Mm, bombardiers. But I pull the shield up and spit up and you hear it pop. And then it hits the ground and it breaks like a piece of china. When it's cold enough to freeze, spit that quick, and then hit ground and, and break that hard because it's frozen that hard, I said, how cold is it up here? 65 degrees below zero without the wind. Yep, yep. Holy crying out loud, that's the coldest I've ever been in my life. You must have been up near Fairbanks. Uh, I think it was Fairbanks. Yeah. Fairbanks gets, gets about 70, 75 below during the worst of the winter. When, when, this, when, this wasn't even the worst of the winter, though. When you, this should have uh, been spring. <laughs> it always gets over 100 degrees in the summer. Good gosh. <laughs> but well, uh, anyway, when, we when, took you can, when you can urinate, I'm using the proper word for this. So Yeah. yeah. When you can urinate and have it freeze before it hits the ground, That's you, cold. you know it's cold. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to put it to you this way. I would not have wanted to try that because <laughs> mine would have receded back up in the pants. Shrinkage, it's shrinkage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would have ended up with wet shorts. No yeah. doubt in my mind. That's cold, brother. I can't handle that. Oh, man. Wow. You know, I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to tell you what, I don't know how people make it like that. They, they, there's there's a lot of really tough people out there. I'm not kidding. You. Well, I, 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 would I like, see somebody has joined us. I would hey. like to go back. Uh, oh, I'll tell you what, I'd like, to, I'd like to go back, but I want to go back in the summertime because he had pictures on the wall in his office of grayling and, uh, Oh, I forgot salmon. what you call it—a trout that goes to the ocean and comes back. And I forgot salmon. the name. Got yeah, I caught a thirty-two pounder in Washington State and had to turn it loose. <laughs> and this fish tailed across the creek in water that he couldn't even get his whole self in. The the fish was like this thick. The water was like this thick. Wow. He tailed across the river, and he—it's really a creek, but they call it a river—and he jumped up these these steps and that's all I know how to call them step because it's like what they were cement steps and he went up into it's a hatchery up there yep I want well when the fish goes up there he goes into this pool and he throws himself against this piece of plywood and he just keeps doing it. I'm saying what is wrong with this stupid fish and there's 40 of them in here doing this anyway they finally come out and they remove this piece of plywood and these fish jump up there and they jump on a conveyor belt so I was invited to come on in and watch. Well, I could tell my fish because he was very distinctive. And he jumps on his conveyor belt. He goes down the conveyor belt. The girl takes a knife and sticks it in. You know. Then they milk him into, he, it was a male, so they milked him into this five-gallon bucket of roe and stirs it with his hands. The fish goes, he puts, plops the fish back down the belt, grabs the next one, does the same thing, except the next one was a female. But anyway... Long story short, 10 minutes later, I bought half of my fish, which was now freeze dried. And I mean, it was hard in plastic on foam. And I bought it and put it in a freezer pack and shipped it back home to North Carolina. That was in Washington State. And it was the darnest thing I've ever seen. But I paid $32 for half of about a little less than half of a fish. And my wife never got it. I don't know how what in the world happened to it. Probably spoiled huh. somewhere. But anyway, nice swim some, away. Yeah, I, I, I sent some. No, it didn't swim away. I saw that <laughs> sucker get. I saw that sucker get staked. I got something I want to say that it's too political to say. <laughs> yeah, but probably a postal worker got it. You know, <laughs> yeah, probably, probably because it was marked fresh trout. You know, I I I, I was uh, when I first went up to Alaska. I was. In a, commercial fisherman worked on a purse stainer and you know i remember one one time we set the the net one time we caught over seventeen thousand fish good grief wow. there were all kinds there were pink salmon there were red uh sockeye salmon 
king salmon and silvers and dog salmon. Probably never heard of dog salmon. Never they're, heard of that. They're big. They they uh, they they're they they're greasier. Actually, I think they make the best uh, dried salmon because of the they are greasier. But anyway, uh, the biggest salmon we ever caught in that net was a hundred and twenty five pounder. King salmon. They're called they're called uh, summer run salmon because what they do is they most salmon as nature set it up this way to protect the species. Most of the fish run in two years. So they're hatched, they go out to sea, two years later they come back, they spawn and they die. Okay. That's what a trout do too. Yeah. And so what happens with one a small percentage of these salmon, if they come back two years, they come back three years. Oh, and okay. So they've been out there in, uh, another year out there, and they they're huge. We thought we had a seal in the net because mm -hmm. it's so huge, and it scared the other salmon in there. So so they he'd come around and they'd all flee over to the other side of the net. But uh, nature does that because it, let's say something happened to the stream and the whole that whole run was wiped out well i've seen streams that are like that that, that one year there'll be no salmon come to it and the next year there'll be salmon come. So what happens is every once in a while these summer runs come in and they'll run up that river that stream or river that is barren and they'll reset the uh the uh the, the stream solid. The, the, yeah. yeah, they reset it up, and pretty soon you got both uh, salmon running every year. So mm. that's just that's, that's just the Japanese that are 12 miles out have taken them all. Yeah, I tell you what, it's it's scary sometimes. We went down to the beach one year, and there was a guy sitting his nets between the end of the pier and the beach. And you'd throw out and get caught in his nets. So we finally decided it was time. We took some of the, instead of running leaders, we just ran the 20 pound line out and put four ounce weights on it. Said, and it would, the weight would bust and we hit, start hitting his boat. And he got upset and come out there with a pistol. Well, just about time he came out there with a pistol, shook a pistol at us like he was gonna shoot somebody. The game warden come out on the pier and he uh -oh. called the, he called the, uh, coast guard they come and made him pull in all his nets and gave him a fine because he's not supposed to be where he was at all he's not supposed to be in that close to shore he's not supposed to be anywhere near within 200 yards of the uh uh pier and he was darn near i mean he was within the casting length of it with a seven foot rod so i didn't even have my deep stuff out there I didn't even have my my uh be, uh oh crap surf fishing rods i had my seven footers for the pier and you we could easily hit his boat i mean we we wore a couple of his windows out <laughs> but anyway the coast guard come up and arrested him and and uh, don't really know what happened after that except they pulled his nets in but it, it's crazy people do i mean in, in on one hand i see because that's their living if they don't catch fish they don't eat that's right. But on the other hand, at least go by the rules. You don't want to wipe the entire species out. That's right. We, but we, uh, one thing about in Alaska, at least on the fishing boats, every one of them got a rifle or two on them. You know? Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. they don't, and, and it isn't because they're being belligerent with anybody, it's because sometimes you get a shark in the net. Sometimes yeah. Sometimes you get the seals get in there, and the seals go after the fish. The, the salmon they love salmon, and they'll hurt yeah. them up, and get them up against the edge of the net, and then they'll, just, they'll bite the heads off of, uh, or or the bellies out of them. And you know you you can't use them. You can't. They're no good to anybody, and they don't eat yeah. the rest of it. And so uh, a seal get in the net, he's liable to get shot. You know? Yeah. Well, I call it a halibut. The last time I was up there, I went on a boat. We didn't go out, but about six miles. And I caught a halibut big enough. He pulled out a rifle. I thought he was after deer. I thought <laughs> he used 22s for those things. He shot this halibut. I said, why are you shooting it? Because I didn't have any idea. How big. I knew it pulled, but I figured if he's that big and he's flat, 
is going to make a lot of force. It's going to be a strong fish. Pull this thing out of the water, and this this was this fish was like four feet wide and about six feet long. And I said, "What the heck have I caught?" He said, "That's a halibut." That's about like, three hundred pounds of halibut. He said he talked about it like well, that's nothing unusual. You know, that's just a halibut, just yeah. a halibut. I've never caught a fish that big in my life. Well, you have now. <laughs> I, I guess you did. It. I guess you did it just for the halibut, huh? Yeah, he was yeah, just for the halibut. Just for the, just for the halibut. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> I was waiting for that line. <laughs> Steve's here. <laughs> I, I actually, I actually uh, was a diver uh, uh, in the fleet, and I would go on. Uh, on the, sometimes it boated back over the net and winded up in the propeller. Oh man, yeah. And and you know, you can't pull a net in. You got fish all over the place in the net, and uh, you know you can anyway. So I would I had air. You know, I had to be real careful with it because sometimes I was 100 miles away from where I could get air. You know, most of I had to send my send my tanks in by airplane to Kodiak and have it uh, filled. But anyway, uh, I did a lot of dives like that under under some of the boats. But when we were anchored out uh, from uh, oh, I forget the name of the town. It's a little ghost town there on the on the Aleutian Peninsula, and uh, it's it's a beautiful setting. Uh, anyway, the we we're anchored out because you can't fish from Friday at six, six o'clock. You have to stop fishing on Friday. Mm -hmm. You can't fish until midnight Monday morning. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. so that gets a bunch of the fish chance to get up the up the river to creeks. Anyway, I'm, I'm I'm asked by the skipper to go under and check the transducer for the sonar because he, it wasn't working right, and he thought they might have painted over it. You know, it over yeah. <laughs> Try to get some airplane stuff in here in the story. <laughs> but anyway, so I couldn't see using my air, so I figured I, I suited up because the, the temperature of the water is about between 32 and 35 degrees, Ooh. and so I I had a I had a cold weather suit, you know. Oh yeah. Anyway, I, and so I put my weight belt on and I, I went over and went down and rolled over my back, pulled myself on, got to the transducer, cleaned it up, came up, I rolled over. I was I was didn't have a tank on, I was free diving. Yeah. And I looked down and we were it we not that deep of water, it was about uh, maybe 20, 25 feet deep. I can see this big bunch of rocks down there, and they, in Alaska they got these uh, uh, sea anemones. They're white. They're like that big, yeah. around, huge. Yeah. And uh, I, 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 there was a bunch of them that were down there, so I, I thought, oh, I want to go down and take a look at these. So I, I go over and hyperventilate and grab the anchor line because I could pull myself down real fast, faster than I could swim down. And I got down there and I'm looking around, and and Here's here here's our anchor set here, and like ten feet in front of the anchor is a huge halibut, and there's another one just off to the left, yeah. and so you know it's pretty big. Well, we had made on the on the boat we'd made a spear kind of thing for spear, mm -hmm. and so I went up and the deck hand up there. I said, "Hey, give me that spear we made. Tie tie. We had some eight hundred pound uh, net repair line there. So tie some of that onto." It what you got? I said, I got a halibut, a big one. And so I hyperventilated again, and this time I had to swim down. But I got right above him with that spear, you know, and I went, boom, like that. And that thing took off, you know, like, yeah, you know, and he got to in, and I told the guy to wear his gloves up there. So all of a sudden it went tight, you know, and he turned like that, and I'm thinking, you're down here with no, no tank. And that thing could wrap you up in that line. You better get out of the water. I went up real quick. The guy was up there, and he, and he dropped the, the spool that the, the line was on. He was bouncing all over the deck, but it was going through his glove. He said, how big is that halibut? And he's bigger than I am. And he said, oh. So, you know, we had snatch blocks and a, and a, and a capstan on there. So he runs, over, runs the line through the snap block. Takes three turns on the capstan, turns the, turns the hydraulics on it, pull that thing right in. Well, 
we got it upside the uh, boat and uh, it was huge. <laughs> it was, a, it. we estimated, to, yeah, we, we had to shoot it. We shot a 30 with a 30 30. Uh, we then gaffed it and lifted it up with the, with the yard arm or the, the arm and put it over on the set of the deck. And that thing is laying there going like that, you know, just trembling. Yeah. And, yeah. and he was about that thick top to bottom on the side. Good grief. And the old cookie, we figured he's 350 pounds. The old cookie comes out of the shack and he's got a big old Dutch oven. Lays that thing on and goes, with his knife, <laughs> around that Dutch oven. We <laughs> there, pulls out this huge hunk of fresh <laughs> out. He made some kind of bully base. I wish I had the uh, recipe because that sucker was delicious. But it was mm -hmm. fresh caught halibut too, you know? Yeah. Hey, we one good like, thing about them new fishing boats, they got backup cameras on them so they don't run over their nets. <laughs> well, yeah, but even then, it happens. <laughs> yeah. It happens. Stuff, stuff happens. Yeah. So anyway, this uh, this halibut is, is a funny story. We we went up trading halibut. One of the uh, boats had gone up in, in the, there and it, it killed a, a, a caribou. And so we traded for some caribou, uh, some halibut, and we, we, we replenished our stores with fresh meat and fresh fish. We never were at a loss for fresh fish. But uh, the thing about caribou, you can you can starve to death eating caribou if that's all you're eating. Because the, they don't have a whole lot of, at least this is what I was told when I was up there. They don't eat There's a no lot. Fat. Huh? There's no fat. There's no fat, but none of that. It's what they eat, lichens and moths and, you know, things that they scrape off of rocks. And that's what they eat, and they, there's not a lot of protein in them. Yeah. And so you can, I mean, it, it tastes good. It it supplements the meal, but, you know, you, you make sure that other things you got there are good and healthy because you'll need it. But it tasted good, and it was better than, you know, you eat fish for so long, and then you want to have something that, you know, walked on land. Yeah. You know, I, I, I had a teacher one time that, that told me I was had to be the dumbest thing there ever was. But I told him, I said, you know, if you, he was talking about when he was in the Army, they had pork so often that he just couldn't stand pork. I said, well, that's all right. I grew up on a farm, and you can have steak so often that you just want a pork chop or some fish. He said, you're yep. the dumbest thing I ever seen. I said, well, same thing. You ate pork all the time and want yep. to eat something different. It's the yep. same thing if you eat steak all the time. You want something different. And exactly. He didn't understand. He didn't understand that. Well, a few years later, after I graduated college, I was out working and I ran ran into him. He said, "You know, I bought a farm right after that, and I started eating a lot of a lot of beef. And I know what you're talking about and what you were talking about now." I said, yeah, well, I, I travel, and I'm a national service tech now, and, and uh, I eat a little bit of everything, but uh, I still, one night I have steak, and the next night I have fish, and the next night I have something different. I can't stand eating the same thing every night. Yeah, yeah. That's why I never got married again. <laughs> oh, oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, I'm not even going to go there, Steve. <laughs> me, me neither. <laughs> I, uh, one of my favorite meals tonight is yeah, go ahead. You got your yeah, head. Yeah, Yeah, I know. <laughs> I see you. Thanks for coming up. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for coming in. You take care of yourself. You take care. <laughs> One of my favorite meals to go out and scavenge for up in Alaska was we get a, a, a with a neat tide, which is lower than the normal low tide. Yeah. And so I would take the skiff over to the beach and a shovel and a couple of gunny sacks. And I would, uh, hey, and I would, I would get, uh, I'd dig clams. And these mm -hmm. beaches that I was digging clams on, uh, there was nobody there. They, they possibly had never been dug before. And I bring up these butter clams, we call them. They're like a regular clam. I know they're what you're like, talking about. They're like this big around, you know, that thick. And you can find those now. You can in Alaska mm. if you go to the right places. I'd like but to it, try that. But, yeah, we take that gunny sack out, hang them into the water off the side of the of the boat, and they clean themselves. You know, they yeah. 
all the sand comes out and all of that. Man, I tell you, there's fried clams. It's pretty good. <laughs> you guys, can we get back to uh, model airplanes? No, oh, I got. Hey, I have a plane. Plan. That might be a good idea. I got I a, a quick. Plan. I got a quick. I got a quick question for Mike. Have you have you have you done any of those propellers yet? Where did Did Mike go? He was there a minute ago. He left. Oh, yeah, I'm doing some propellers. He got got a question. He's gone away for a minute. He'll be back. Has anybody run a long stroke 61 um, stalker? Stalker? No, not yet, but I want to. I don't know. Mine may be a long stroke, but mine, I bought mine back. What's the difference? Well, one has a longer stroke than the other one. <laughs> and a very distinctly no, what, different, what, what's the different, different sound. No, I, I'm sorry. What's the difference in run characteristic? I don't know. We don't know because we okay. never run the motor before, and okay. it came with two heads, and we're not sure what color the original head is. If it's red or if it's gold. 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 Yeah. There was a one. One head was blue. One of the, one of the early ones was blue. And then there was gold that came next. And then after that, it was silver. So the blue ones, if you run them enough, kind of turned kind of an orangish color. That might be what you have. Now, this one, this one's new, but it's the guy bought it, bought another head for it. And I'm not, and if you look at it, one looks like a high compression head and one looks like a low compression head. Well, one's for nitro and one's for no nitro. Right. No, that would make that would make sense. But that's what I was kind of thinking too, because it doesn't seem like um, another head would fit on the long stroke because the bore would be different and still be a sixty-one. You have well, to make hmm. you have to make the bore smaller to make the the stroke longer. Otherwise, you come up, you know, with a new number. Yeah, with a new number because. I think that the 61 long stroke was, doesn't Stalker make a 67? 66. 66. They took a 66 and deboard it or whatever, made a smaller bore, and that, that became the 61 long stroke. That's what I heard, but nobody really knows about them. Ruslan would know, the guy that. Yeah, he would know for sure. Yeah. Okay. If you can get a hold of him. He's the guy. Nick got a hold of uh, Tom, and Tom knew nothing about the long stroke at all. Oh, he, that was before he, before his, his time with soccer. Yeah. He the manufacturer, Ruslan, in, in Ukraine. <coughs> you sent him an email. Okay. Yeah, if you take my part. Charles, do you have his information? Yeah, I have it. It's uh, I think it's control line parts. But uh, yeah, Steve, if I can forward it to you, Steve, I have your contact information. Okay. Yeah, because it's it's you put it in a uh, um, SV twenty two, and um, haven't flown it yet. But we did the high compression head just so we could we figure run normal stock or fuel I, fuel I would think. Yeah. So no. So no nitro. Right. Right. Okay. Well, that's the that guess, but I didn't know, you know, how they ran, what the characteristics was, you know, from a, a, a regular run like that. one. They run a lot like an ST60 Super Tiger, but a little better. The long stroke or the? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. They got you a lot know, better manners probably, and they're easier to start. You prop them with a, with a six or seven inch pitch, and I think you'd run them about. 7,000 RPM to 8,000, somewhere in there. That sounds about right. Seven, 7,800 is where mine's happy. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. I, I got a question for y'all. We got a quorum of people that know stalkers. I thought that I had no nitro fuel. It is no nitro. But instead of being 18% oil, I'm told that what I got is 22% oil, and it's half castor, half synthetic. Have I heard anything? Yeah, I've heard it. You'll have to decoke it uh, if you keep running it. Yeah, I wouldn't run it in a stocker. Well, I'm not. A, I'm, I have ceased and desisted, but I've run about a half a gallon of fuel through. 
You haven't heard anything. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna just I've hung the plane up until I get some no no caster fuel. You want but some I, seventeen to eighteen percent all all synthetic? Yeah, all I called and asked about right. it. If you have some, it, if you yeah. have feel like you've gotta have some caster in there, then five percent. I wouldn't go over that. Well what I'm gonna do, go I've got a it turns out I have a my niece's boyfriend races go karts. Mm -hmm. And he's going to get me five gallons of alcohol and and uh, four quarts of uh, castor of uh, castor, of all synthetic clots. fuel. I forgot clots. Right. There you go. Clots. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, he says he said I'll get you a water bottle, a dry water bottle, and I'll show you how to mix it. He Good mixes idea. his own. He mixes his own for the go karts. And yep. he said he said uh, I'll show you how to mix it. And then if you want to mix some for the other planes. I'll show you how to mix that too. I said, "Well, where in the world would I get nitro?" He says, uh, "Uncle Philip, don't uh, sweat it." <laughs> That's great. I That's think great. Knows, I think he knows where to get nitro, and it, the, nitro is strictly illegal in go karts. But I think they run it anyway. Uh -huh. He he says he says we put two additives in our fuel that are not supposed to be there, and the judges look the other way. One of them is gasoline. So that if there's a fire, you can see it. He says, once you put that in there, the judges, they don't even look at that. He says, nitromethane depends on wh who's the judge that night. But well, uh, like when I raised gold carts, we ran uh, um, Klopp's, uh, oh, shit. Well, Castro. Um, go something gold. Um, yeah, it's gold. I can't think of what it is, but it does say gold on it. That has but, nitro in it. Oh, okay. If That's you, what the deal is. If you take that oil, and we used to do it all the time, mix our fuel, take yeah. a match, and throw it on the can, that thing will go whoop, boop, yeah. and, and make a little popping noise. Yeah. But, yeah, that oil is... Uh, as flammable as gasoline or whatever it would be. Yeah, I'll tell you. There's a lot of that stuff that's wild. Blends all know. gold. That's what it was called. Blends that's all it. gold. We that's used got to, something in it that really burns. <coughs> and we've got we used to take uh, we used to run them on pure castor oil. Just take castor oil, that's what was in the crankcase. And as long as you when you finish the race would we'll take it out and drain it right now, you were fine. And we used to take it and run it. And then we put some kerosene in it, pull the spark plug wire off, and run, turn the motor over a few times, and drain the kerosene out, and put the plug back in. And the next week we'd pour fresh uh, uh, oil in the thing and be ready to go again. But if you ever let that darn caster cool off in that block, it became jelly, and now you got to take everything apart. It was a mess. Yep. And I did it once. Wait. Once. Never did that again. I tried to uh, put in gasoline in uh, in uh, model airplane fuel does. You use, you use Coleman white gas, like stove gas. Mm -hmm. It only takes uh, uh, a couple of tablespoons in a gallon. You will extend your run time. This is a trick. If you got if you got a, you can't get a bigger tank in and you're just shy of making the whole pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, you can put a, a little Coleman gas in your fuel, and it will extend it to where you'll be able to make the make the. There's more BTUs in the gasoline, is what it is. Well, that's cool. I'll have that's to remember it. that. Yeah, if it's you guys no lead. Coleman white gas is just no lead. That's right. Yeah. You need no lead. You know, it's just well, no lead is all it is because they didn't want you using a Coleman heater burning leaded gasoline in your <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, if you ever if you ever discover that your plane is burping and making weird noises in weird times, you can put four ounces of, oh, crap, now I forgot the name. I had it on the tip of the tongue a minute ago. The stuff that's used on your dashboard to make it shine. Uh, oh, yeah. Armor on. Armor on. Armor on. Four drops of armor on to a tank of fuel, and it will not burn. You take a gallon of fuel and sit yeah. here and shake it up, and the whole top of it looks like the head of a beard. But right. it will mess up your blow plugs. I've never heard of one. I get a hundred flights out of local you taters. If yeah, you, you get taters on them. I mean, yeah. like crazy. And you go in there and pick them off and shit. 
But yeah, you'll. Uh, any problem. I never had any problem. From, we ran a, run. a uh, an Enya motor, a bigger one, and the thing started running worse and worse and worse. We pulled the glow plug out, and it had the taters, we called them all over it. We pulled the head <laughs> off. The head even had them on there. Hmm. Wow. And, and we never quit, heard of that. Yeah, we quit using armor off. Well, yeah. I, I, you only need a couple of drops. Of yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah. Only, a couple of drops. That's it. If you overdo it now, I have heard that if you overdo it, it will put the flame out. You will ruin a gallon of fuel. Cause yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's a water-based silicone. Yeah, I put I too mean, much. I have a better in idea. Water water use it. You want to drop some silicone in there? Well, I put too much in <laughs> one, and Tom took and put my gallon, his gallon together, and we made two gallons of, in other cans. In other words, we diluted it. So two drops to a gallon yeah. of fuel is all you need. Two, three drops, that's it. But if you use too much, you might have a problem. But it will. You can take shake that gallon up, and it will not foam. I've got a 38 special profile that just would not run. Just would not run. You couldn't stand it. It would take off. Everything's fine. As soon as you start doing anything, it's it start act, acting up and burping and doing all sorts of weird numbers. So Tom Dixon was there. Tom designed the 38 Special. And he walked over and he says, open your fuel up. And he took this little thing and he said, drip, drip. And he shook it up one time. He said, put some fresh fuel in the plane, go fly it. Went and flew it and never had another problem. I couldn't figure out what in the world he'd done. This was a plane had a fox 40 on it never had any more trouble with it and i must have run god i went all summer in that plane and i never i ran i flew that thing 400 and some flights that year i never changed the glow plug i never touched the needle valve all summer long and that was that one still holds the record for the longest time without a needle valve adjustment and terry mcdowell will, will say will tell you that it's the longest plane ever to never need never have a needle valve adjustment and the reason is very simple he went to adjust the needle valve and when he did he hit it and it broke off <laughs> i couldn't adjust it I, I said i'm gonna fly it until i can't fly it anymore and i just kept <laughs> flying it finally at the end of the season randy smith I, somewhere with randy smith and smith said i hear you need a needle valve i said yes sir i need one of your needle valves because i tried to order them twice he didn't have them. he handed me a little envelope had three of them in it i think I tried to pay him for it, and he says, so Randy's a pretty good dude. You just got to catch him on the right day. Oh, I, yeah, I know, Phil, that. you'll know about it, but these other guys. On eBay, I finally got my hands on a Super Tiger G40. All right. You wanted one? Huh? You wanted one? Yeah, the sand-casted one. Oh, I don't know if it's sand-cast, but I've got a G40 downstairs. I'd have sent it, you if I known you wanted it. The schnurl, the schnurl ported one that has the blue head on it. No, oh, no, 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 not that thing. Mine's yeah, this is off. this is a different. This was what was like before the before they came out with the S forty, the S sixty one. Okay, it was yeah, the I same. Know. It was sand casted. It had a blue, a light blue head on it, and yeah. they're really rare. And <coughs> I got on eBay and I got it for sixty three dollars. I couldn't. Be, I figured it would go for two hundred and fifty, but I'm like, I'm gonna get me one of them because I always wanted one, and I could never get one. Very nice. That's the best, that's when the you best get it, reason in the world. Show us when you get it, huh? You know when you get it, show it to us. Yeah, I will. It it doesn't have the the front. It doesn't have the nut and the washers and shit on it, but I can come up uh, with that. Tiger. I mean, you know, they're common. Yeah. Right? But yeah, I couldn't believe that I uh, I scored one of them. My brother has one, oh, and uh, he's never ran it just because it's so rare that. But I'm gonna run my anything I get. I run. I'm gonna put it on an airplane. Well, let me let me tell you one. You you you're at fault for this, so I'm gonna tell, go ahead and tell you about it. I looked at your uh, little toy airplanes there in the background salon. So I did some swapping with a guy here a while back, and I ended up with a vector. I've got a red vector. Well, a buddy of mine here, most of you that have been to Brodak, you've met him. Uh, Bill Mandakis passed away a few months ago, and I got one of his power systems. It's a, a RSM electric power system. So I have planned all this around putting the RSM power system in there, just 
putting thanks bill on the plane and whatever i got that thing and got started on it rsm is the only motor i've ever seen you got two holes that are standard distance apart and two that are way inside of that so it's yeah. it's kind of i don't know how to i don't know how to say it but it's not it's like two different circles it's weird not so I ended, there you go asymmetric that's the word so i ended up I ended up having to put a 2826 in it, which is what it calls for. But yeah. anyway, I put a I put a Cobra instead of a, a Brodac. But that RSM motor that that's that disappointed me more than I can tell you. I really wanted to use Bill's system in it, but now I'm I'm about to decide to put a uh, Castle speed control. It's already set up for the RSM speed control. I think I'm gonna change it and put a Castle in it and a Huben timer because. What you told me now, I'm kind of scared of that RSM mm -hmm. timer. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I'm I'm, they say that you can send it back and they can reprogram it mm -hmm. and and do something to it so it's not as sensitive or whatever. But, yeah, I mean, you know, you know the same guy don't have it anymore. Yeah. Eric Rule, Eric Rule sold it. And uh, I don't know. I don't know how the new guy's doing. Uh, what I heard from Bill, Bill quit dealing with him, and that tells me there was a problem because Bill didn't get upset with anybody, and he got upset with a guy about something. So I think I'm gonna let them old dogs lie. Yeah, you know, if you put it in a non-flapped airplane, I think you'll be fine. It's like I told yeah. you, we only have problems in a flapped airplane where you can really turn a corner. Well, if I put it in my Tiyosaki, it'll have more trouble than it will. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, like a say a normal flap, uh, unflap. Yeah, airplane. yeah. The Something Tiyosaki like, turns like a like uh, trans uh, revolution. It just it flies so deep into a turn and just pow. And I've never, I don't know, something about that airplane. I don't know what it is, but I've tried my best to retire that plane for two years, and every time I try to retire it, I find myself ordering a order an icona coat and, and uh, sanding sand and sandpaper and paint to recover it again but i end up putting four or five hundred flights a year on that cotton picking airplane because it just flies so well oh, i still have the same question does anybody out there have an actual paper drawing of that airplane there is one i have it uh but it's not right as soon as i get around to building a new one i will draw in okay. the parts that um uh, if you look on um uh, outer zone uk okay they they list it okay now when you go to build it uh get in touch with me and i'll tell you what to do different than what's on that drawing because the it's not quite right no the wing at the fuselage you're supposed to have some 1 16th you don't put foam up against the fuselage you put 1 16th on also, the edge okay. of the foam and okay. you put that to the to the fuselage the spars are supposed to come out uh, come out of the top and bottom of the, of the where the spars usually are and there's one on the leading edge that is not drawn right on those plans i'll tell you how to do it and if you'll do that right you'll have a, a plane that is bulletproof and it just flies so well that's awesome uh, i went i went from a, a rough intermediate to an advanced pilot in a year flying that airplane but i also flew more that year than i'd flown in the three years before because i had a plane that just flew so darn well because i mean we really need to save that design out there and be able to, to build it otherwise it doesn't mean anything to anybody if nobody can draw get one or get the plan for one well i can I build have, it but i need a plan i have the i have the plans i have copies of the original templates which i understand awesome. were destroyed which i understand were destroyed but i have copies of them <laughs> and clayton knew i got copies of them he was standing right, right. there Mine is the last plane that that Clayton had a hand in building. Clayton oh, wow. was too Clayton was That's too awesome. sick. Clayton was too sick to build it himself, and he had promised me a plane. So he says, "If you'll bring some boss over to the house, we'll build you a Tiasaki." Now Clayton never That's awesome. Clayton never touched the plane, but okay. he watched me build it, looked over my shoulder the whole time, told me everything to do, and That's the first awesome. time I flew it, he came out and flew it. He came out and watched it. He never flew it. Okay. I don't think I ever saw him fly again after we started my plane. But none of us knew Clayton had cancer. Wow. None of us knew it. Tommy Looper didn't know it. They were best friends. And uh, 
we finally, Clayton wasn't there one Saturday. We all wondered what happened, what happened. So Tommy said, I'm going to go home and call and find out what's, what's going on with Clayton. I hadn't seen him in a couple of weeks. And his wife called Tom back and told him that he was in the hospital dying of cancer. That's first any of us knew. Oh, wow. Clayton, Clayton was a very private person, but he was yeah. he was amazing. To this day, when somebody has an overrun at Hobby Park, somebody will holler, all right, Clayton. Because Clayton was known for overruns. Lord, he had overruns. But he was a mess. He was one in a million. He's one of those people oh, that you're awesome. really glad you knew. He was a mess. Yeah. But anyway, I've met a lot of people like that in this hobby. That's one thing about this hobby. There's a lot of unforgettable people. Some of them you wish you could forget. <laughs> 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 yeah, there's a few no, of those we, out there. Yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I tell you what. They, they some, of, some of the times you wish you could forget and some of the times you, you're just glad you can't because it's – there's some unforgettable people. Uh, Les McDonald hadn't flown in years, but every time his name comes up, I think of one thing, Mr. Machine. He, he was, I've never seen anybody yep. fly five or six times a day. And every flight was exactly like the one before it and perfect or as close wow. to it as I've ever seen. Wow. He was, he was just a machine Wow. and a real gentleman to boot. Billy Wurwich. I mean, what can you say? The man, he's done it all. And nobody can build a plane awesome. that big and it be that light. I went to the Nats. And Billy Wurwich is there with his GOXL. And I had heard stories of how light the plane was. Well, I've met Bobby Hunt, you know, and I knew Bobby fairly well. I said, Bobby, is that plane really as light as I'm hearing it is? He says, yeah, it really is. Bobby, it can't be. It's too big. So he went over. He said, come here. We went over. He introduced me to, Bob, to Billy Wurwich. And right. found out that Billy's a guitar player, and I thought, hey, we got something in common. And then I heard Billy play a guitar a little bit later, and I said, no, we ain't either. <laughs> I, pick, I, fool with a, I fool with a guitar. Billy plays one. Man, he is wow. amazing. But anyway, uh, I pick, he said, well, pick it up. So I went over and picked the thing up, and it's as light as they say it is. I don't know how wow. anybody – he's got trained termites or something is all I know. <laughs> Wow. It's, it's amazing. He's, helium. He's, you put helium inside the wings. He must. <laughs> there is no way you can build an airplane that big and it weighs what that thing that weighs. Light. It's just ridiculous. And Billy don't believe in any uh, stab misalignment or motor tilt. Everything's one-to-one, -one, straight. But his planes always fly right. I think Jeff's pretty close. Yeah. Hey, Jeff. I think you, know, you build up? them pretty close to that light. I got lucky with the uh, Olympic. That, wow. one's, that one's 17 ounces with no motor and no finish. Wow. Oh. Not wow. bad. That's, That's incredible. Pretty good. That's pretty well, I good. Went, I, went and weighed, uh, I went and weighed one of mine I thought was light, and it's 48 ounces. It's a big airplane, but it's 48 ounces. Now that's everything, motor and everything, but I got stabs that weigh more than seventeen ounces. <laughs> Here's one for you, man. Holy Here's cat. One for you, man. Yeah. All right. You cannot just say it's the light plane, but it, because it has to be in reference to the size of the plane. Well it's ten. It's the lightest forty size plane. It's the lightest yeah, fifteen so size this, plane. It's the lightest this, whatever. This, was, this is the lightest this is the lightest forty six plane I've ever had, but it's still it's Tiyosaki, it's profile. You know, there's not right. much there. Yeah, but not a lot. I thought it was a lot lighter than what it was. I was stunned how heavy it was when I finally put it on a scale. But mm -hmm. it's still one of the best flying planes I've ever had. Yeah. But uh, I love a Gieske Nobler. I mean, I just love a Gieske Nobler. Everybody says, why don't you build something different? So I built a 57 Nobler, and trust me, it ain't the same beast. I like the, I like the Gieske. <laughs> anyway. There's a lot of good airplanes. I, I I can't get that thing of yours out of my head now. I'm I'm looking for that one. Yeah. But uh, there's a there's a lot of nice airplanes. Tom Looper's Ombre, if you've ever seen one of those, that's an outstanding airplane. Uh, have no idea what it weighs. I've got one downstairs, but I have no idea what it weighs. It's not painted yet, so no no point in putting it on the scales yet. But uh, I tell you what, there's some guys. 
when I went to the Worlds, I was stunned how much there's everybody else's airplanes and then there's the U.S. airplanes. Our planes are just, they just seem to be a step above everybody else's. But there was a few well, still. I don't that, know how you that, can say that. One of the Canadians are in with us. You no, no, I, with... I, no, I'm just saying, I don't know how, um, I mean, Igor Berger, I, I'm sure he's not behind you guys. Igor, you know? no, Igor's not behind anybody, but Igor wasn't around back then, or he didn't come to that world. Okay, I see what you mean. You're talking But the the, the, okay. uh, the French guys, um, right? kid and his dad, and he was second that year to Billy. Oh, that's and uh, his Behringer, airplane, Behringer, he yeah. absolutely amazed me. That is a huge airplane to be flying with a 56. <laughs> right. But wow. he had counter-rotating 56 and a homemade propeller wow. turning the other way, counter-rotating or uh, clockwise rotation. Yeah. And that thing just fascinated me. I watched that thing and watched it and watched it. It just fascinated me. Amazing airplane. It's so big, and the front end is so big. I figured it'd be grabbing air and burping, but it didn't. <laughs> it didn't. It flew great. I don't know. It's all in what you can make work, I guess. Uh, he made it work. I mean, he yeah. made it work. The next year, two years later, he was world champ with that airplane. Wow. The same, yeah. the same airplane. Not one like yeah, it. Got... The same one. Yeah, because he managed make... to get it trimmed and set up to suit him. Yeah, we own a company that makes brakes for full size aircraft. Yeah. Oh, That's is that what they do? Though. Well, I tell you what, I saw pictures of them in Europe. I don't know where, but his, you know, it's a father and son, and then the grandson, and the grandson has a Tom. Where'd you go? The grandson has there you are. The grandson has a uh, Cadrone with a. I've forgotten what size. But it's a Catron, and it that is a gorgeous airplane. I wanted to plan for that so bad, but uh, you, you can find pictures of it, but no plans. And usually the, the Bergers usually publish their plans, so it probably will be available, but I haven't seen it yet. I just like studying plans. I, I buy a lot of plans just to look at the plane to see how people are building to try to pick up tips. What are you what doing, Peter? I'm at Oshkosh. I'm at the the Behringer's at Oshkosh um, when I was volunteering with the control line um, kid venture yeah, like a magnum. yeah. and he, he did a, a demonstration there and so that's where I met him they're the really nice people yeah they're really nice people I didn't he know he didn't know me from Adam's house cat and I had some questions and he had to go and he says hang on just a second he handed me his business card he says, he text me, email me, whatever, and I'll answer all your questions. And so I text him probably two years later and ask him some questions about the plane. And he answered every one of them. They're just real nice people. Wow. What do you got going on there, Peter? All right, that windy video. I'm trying to see what airplanes those are. That's Bill Rex. Like I think that looks like a that looks like a Magnum. He just laid down. It is. Oh, that's a counter rotating prop. Yes, Randy's with a counter rotator. Yeah. Yeah, but it's most... a fake. Uh, it's a fake counter rotation. Well, he calls it fluid drive, and he says air is a fluid. But it made the most ungodly sound running that I've ever heard. And when the motor stops, it sounds like the longest, loudest bilabial fricative you have ever heard. <laughs> this isn't working. Kill that shit. <laughs> yeah, that's Bill. Yeah, that's Bill Rich's airplane. Looks like Bill's planes were always beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Another SV guy. Yeah. It's got a big art bumper on there. Sure does. I haven't heard from uh, Bill Rich in a long time. He's out of it now. He says his arthritis is so bad he just can't do it anymore. There's Alan Rick. That's a shame because I thought he was coming back. Well, I hope he does, but the last time I talked to him, he said he was out of it. Well, that's too bad. That's too bad. Yeah. I always wanted to go fly at his ranch, but. Oh, you had a ranch too? Bill Rich? Yeah. Yeah, he's. He's a damn cattle guy or whatever. So oh, damn. Cattle. That's right. Yeah. Wish you had sound to that one. That is that is the wildest sounding motor I've ever heard. Really? Let me see if I can increase the volume on that. It sounds like it's humming and whistling at the same time. Really? Yeah. is smoking i'll tell you that yeah he used randy randy liked to tell us he had sr 71 oil in it huh and you really what i what i know and what i was able to learn of sr 71 oil with my friends in the air force uh, there is no way he could have afforded sr 71 oil you really can't you really can't uh, the audio is not very good on that video yeah I'm going to tell you the, 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 the neatest part though is when the motor quits if you ever it's an eerie sound in that flying you, you would not want that sound coming at you at night when you couldn't see what was coming it would scare the bejeebers out of you but when the motor quits when the motor quits it does literally sound like the longest loudest bilabial fricative you've ever heard huh. well the shapes are nice oh well, randy can fly yeah, we walked that one, though. He sure did. My best Randy Smith story, he was here at Winston-Salem flying in a, one of our last contests, one of our last big contests in uh, at Hobby Park. And he got so low on the back side, on the back side of his wing over, that his rudder hit the ground. Well, you could see the duck. When he finished, we walked over and looked, and you could see dust on the ground for a quarter of a lap oh wow but <laughs> well, that is low yeah he was right on the ground if he'd gone down any the prop would have hit would have been over but it was just dust was there for for a quarter of a lap i said my goodness randy and he went over and looked at it and his knees started shaking. <laughs> he said i knew it was low but good grief that is really low well, guys, I'm out of here. All right, Steve. Oh, thanks. man. You take care of yourself, sir. Yeah, I'm going to clean it up and go look. I'm sure to Michigan tomorrow or whatever. We'll see if I make it. Going to the contest? It's a, it's a fun deal. They got carrier and they got some racing and the fun stunt. and They just do different things. Well, ain't nothing wrong with that. Slalom. It's all good. Yeah. So, well, good luck. Have a good time. We're we're supposed to have three days of rain, so uh, I'll be working on planes this weekend, I guess. All righty. Yeah, well, you guys have a good you. one. Have a safe trip. See you later. Take care, yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So even the dog said goodbye. Yeah, I got that. <laughs> that. That's funny. Lordy, lordy. I got my buddy here. So Jeff, what you been up to, Jeff? Put it down. Oh, my paint stand? That's the nose brace for Lens Next Profile. Oh. <laughs> 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 it weighs about a pound and a half. 
That should do. That's enough. I'll put a road jet 90 on it. It'll fly it. <laughs> no, this is the uh, actually. You know, I like pieces. my lumber wagons. These two pieces are the base for uh, the paint stand. Very good. Wow. Looks nice. Oh, nice my. work there. <laughs> yeah, looks really nice. I'm, I am building two of them. One for me and one for you. <laughs> Actually, one for Charles and one for John right now. There you go. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm only kidding. Yeah. I think Mike, Mike will be happy to see that I'm uh, building his wings, one <laughs> of the ones that he, he gave me. Yeah. All right. I wish I had like a laser car to make like a build up uh, uh, wing with a wood, wood wing. Uh, but I don't have one. So I, I tried to cut it by hand and stuff like that. And yeah, it worked fine, but you know, too many mistakes, and I said, eh, I wasn't very happy with it. But I'm Practice not. Practice makes perfect. Huh? Practice makes perfect. Yeah, I mean, it's like almost always, like if you make like a straight up wing where you have a bunch of wings, you can block sand them together and stuff like that. Yeah. It's probably easier to make that cutting one at a time with the razor blade. I mean, just it's not so hard. It's tough. Um, I know. So, yeah. so. Yo, what's up? Do you, do you have a sheet metal break, or do you own a sheet metal break, or? How do I you have a four that? foot. I have a four foot finger break. Okay. But uh, I don't use it because it's out back in the shed. Oh. Because it's in the way in the garage. I got a little eighteen inch Harbor Freight one that I use to make fuel tanks. But this is this is fourteen gauge welded. Okay. If you, if you can, I don't know if you can see inside it very yeah. well. But oh yeah, I see now. Yeah, it's it's ugly inside. The outside's nice though. Yeah, it looks really good. That's excellent, Jeff. What yeah, what are you guys using to to hold an electric plane? I have a paint stand for a fuel plane. But how in the world do you hold an electric plane to paint it? Has anybody got any good tricks or ideas? How does no. the engine mount? <clears throat> well, that'd be putting all the strain on it on the very front of the airplane. Okay, so it's front mounted. Yeah, let me use the front mount. Yeah, just put some, some uh, we'll just make a plate that's going to mount to that and screw it in. Can you make a plate that'll mount to the firewall behind it? Well, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm making a plate that screws on the front and then goes in and, and grabs the plate behind it. They're having to put a hole in the plane back there so I have something to just put it in as an index point so mm -hmm. all the stress is not on the very front of the airplane, you know, half mm -hmm. inch from the front of the plane. Yeah, and that's but, got, that, that doesn't have any engine bearers in it, does it? No, no. Yeah, otherwise you, no, you, it's could, all, you could drill a couple of holes in the engine bearer and just put it on a motor plate. Oh yeah, that's what I kept thinking. But there's, you know, there's nothing up there. I'm building a uh, Bob Hunt's uh, uh, Crossfire, and man alive, there's nothing up there. I mean, I got it ready to paint. And I'm trying to figure out, okay, now how do I hold this thing to paint it? So, why don't you put a post on the forum? Maybe uh, you might get a good response. I might do that. I called Bob and asked him about it. He's he's uh he says just put a rod through the front of it. But if I do that, uh, I tried that actually, and the wind got it, and then the plane rocked, and the post came out. It's a side loader for the battery, and the door popped open, and then oh, it it I about had a mess. I was afraid I was going to lose the airplane. I was afraid it was going to rip the front end off of it. So I got to come up with a better way. But I think I'm just going to put drill a hole in the back and run yeah. a pin all the way in. You know what I'm thinking? Bob had, had an idea to put the post through. But what I would do, just take a piece of balsa wood, drill a hole through it, and put the post and glue it in where the firewall wall would be. And when you're done with the painting and stuff like that, just knock it out. Cut it, and cut it, it out. Done good deal. idea, Trey. See? Good idea. Good idea. I'll try that. I knew I was good for something. Uh, you, if I had your talent, I wouldn't worry about it too much. <laughs> He's a very smart character, but you are a character. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord. 
I tell you what, so, if you if you got if you got enough strong, uh, smart people around, you can always come up with an answer. Somebody knows. Yeah. 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 Somebody. Yeah. Somebody knows. Train comes up with a lot of good ideas, though. He does. He's a smart don't cookie. He don't he don't think so, but I think so. Oh lordy. So uh, did I tell you guys I had some nice success uh, with the uh, with the timer I'm, I'm making? Uh huh? No, you said you were working on one, but that's as far as I heard. Yeah, I'm working on one. So I made the software, and I was uh, I made it like a test rig with a motor on a piece of stick, you know, kind of spinning around. Yeah, right? you showed us that. Yeah. Oh yeah. She. Uh, so I start to run it, and uh, uh, it seems like it's holding the 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 R 